Hello, this is Sarah Jane Mee taking charge of the Sky News Daily podcast for the next few episodes. And to explain what we're going to do, we found something from the archives. Everyone will pay for it and everyone will benefit from it. When you're ill, you won't have to pay for it. Yours, whenever you want it, with your own choice of doctor. And that goes for the whole family. That's from 1948, a government information film about the start of the NHS. A lot has changed since then. Animation is a lot better than the graphics used in that film for a start. But some things haven't really. Everyone pays for it. Everyone can benefit from it. But how do we have an NHS that's fit for purpose all these years on? We're giving the health service its own checkup. We've got guests and experts to do that, including someone who used to have the big job, Sir David Nicholson. He used to run the NHS in England. It was a big job when I did it. You know, over a million people worked for the NHS. Patricia Hewitt, one of the Secretary of States I worked for, said that if the NHS was a country, it had been the 33rd largest country in the world. So it's a massive enterprise, but enormously important for the heart of the country. I started working in the NHS in the mid-70s. I worked for over 40 years for the NHS overall. I spent 10 years working in mental health. I spent 10 years working in acute services, running hospitals. I've spent time running health services in the big cities, in Birmingham and in London. And for eight years, I was the chief executive of the NHS. I was uh, appointed by the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, I then worked for Gordon Brown and for David Cameron. And during that period, I had six secretaries of state. It was an absolute privilege to be part of the NHS. It is such a wonderful healthcare system. During COVID, I came back and I currently still uh, are engaged in chairing the boards that run health services in the black country. So I kind of can't give it up. <laughs> it's not quite like a drug. Uh, but it is just the most remarkable thing to be part of and a privilege. You know what the solutions could be, and you are equally as passionate about how to make the NHS better, to fix it, if you like. One of the things that I've learned is that there is no silver bullet. If you understand that, you can then search for the things that are useful. And there are lots of ideas and lots of people who have great, kind of solutions to the problems that we're facing. I am myself consistently optimistic about the NHS. I've compared the system with others around the world. And whilst there are undoubted problems, we have the system and the principles that can make it right in a way that many other countries can't because of the way their healthcare systems are structured. I'm really looking forward to meeting the people that are going to be coming on that journey with us, some from the NHS, some from outside, to help us piece together a kind of sense of direction, if you like, a roadmap, which will help us to think about the kinds of things that we can do both short medium and long term, which can improve the functioning of the NHS. And as you said, the NHS is such a big beast. There is no way we could cover it all. But we are going to focus on four areas that are pertinent to people listening to this and four areas that you wanted to focus on. They are A&E, cancer, mental health and public health. Why do you think these areas in particular need to be focused on? They're all of interest to the general population outside of a small group of health policy mm -hmm. wonks. So for A&E, we know the pressures on the system, but what would a great A&E service look like? And what do we need to do to make it like that? Cancer, another example. There are things that we know, innovations that are being developed as we sit here, which could be applied, which could improve outcomes for for patients. Mental health, an area which is rapidly developing, but both in terms of public understanding, but also the demands on the population post-COVID. And finally, how can we support our population to be both healthy and have a real sense of well-being? Public health is crucial in all of that. We're doing this 
mini series about the NHS because we want to make the conversation accessible to people because everybody has experience of the NHS. And this isn't going to be a, a pointy headed debate full of experts. Don't get me wrong. We're going to speak to lots of clever and passionate people, yourself amongst them. What is it you want people to take away from this podcast series? It tends to be very polarised, the conversation about the NHS. Either people saying it's brilliant or it's terrible. And both of those things can be true at the same time, depending on the experience. So getting people to understand what the real underlying issues are as to why they see it in the way that they do. Certainly to be constructive, not just saying this is bad, but okay, so what can we do about it is important. And the third thing is to expose people to the really passionate, enthusiastic people who are leading bits of this service to get over to people that actually it's often not a lack of motivation or will that puts us in the places that we are. But these people are brilliant and should be nurtured and supported. David, what we want to explore in this series as well is that so often when this comes up in conversation about how to fix the NHS, the answers are always given as more money, more beds. But actually, it's not as simple as that. And there are actually many more options and answers available. If we'd have had this conversation in the late 1980s, early mm. 1990s, people would have said the way to improve it is to introduce more competition into it. That was the kind of zeitgeist of health policy across the world. Now it's completely different to that. Because what we discovered through competition in healthcare was what it did. It reduced quality and in, in increased cost. It did the exact opposite. It's about how all the various bits fit together. Now, what that means then is what you don't do is put all of your money into one of them, which has predominantly been put into hospitals. That, that is not the way we'll get the best mm. outcome for our patients. Sometimes it's using money in very different ways. And that's what I think the NHS will need to do in the future. So they give a flavour of what's to come over the next four episodes. How do we fix the NHS? Let's get started, shall we? In Holland, you can't walk into an emergency department. You either have to be taken there by ambulance or referred by your GP. These are a simple blood tips that could actually detect whether there are any circulating cells that are changing into cancer. That is going to be transformational. Pre-pandemic, it was one in nine. It's now one in six children need support with their mental health. And so that is a huge increase in the number of children that are in trouble with their mental health across the country. People keep telling me X is the new smoking. No, tobacco is still the new tobacco. Help us with the societal effort to push really hard to get smoking prevalence as low as it can go. It's probably the chief health risk at the moment. 